So as you know, we've been talking about heaven for quite some time. I don't know exactly how long, maybe five weeks now. Last week was Family Sunday, so we did a very simple 10-minute message of just trying to help kids see, have some clearer depiction, uh, clearer picture of what the biblical heaven will be like for us. Um, and this week, I really, this week and next week, I, I'm confident that we can finish by next week. Um, I planned to finish this week, but as I got into it, I was just like, there's too many wonderful things um, to talk about and look at. And so now we're moving into talking about what the future heaven will look like. If you've been around at all, we started talking about the effect that eternity has on us as we begin having an eternal perspective and being a people recognizing that when Jesus saves us, we get a taste of eternity, um, but that our ultimate inheritance comes after death or if we're alive when Jesus returns. And that currently the heaven that those who have passed away already are experiencing is different than what the future heaven will be like. The present heaven is different than the future heaven. We spent a week talking about what does that mean? Like if we were to pass away today in Jesus, where would we go and what would that look like? And I know for many of you in here, and even for some of you, you've grown up your entire life in church and never heard the idea that heaven for us is actually the earth, that God is recreating a new heavens and a new earth. The heavens meaning the stars and the galaxy and the universe and a new earth. And so uh, we'll look at some of that, but I really wanted to get into talking about what the new heaven will be like and more so its physical properties and answering some of the questions there. And then next week we'll wrap up by talking about like, what will we be like? Because the scriptures teach that we will have glorified bodies. What does that mean? Will we eat and drink? Where will we live? What will life look like? Things like that. But today I wanna to talk more about the physical characteristics. Um, anyone in here have a trip planned for this fall? I have one planned. Uh, we're going to, I think, Sapphire Valley in North Carolina, I think it was, is what it's called. The pictures look awesome, little lakes and mountains. It's interesting because the idea of planning for a trip, we get excited about it. Like when we think about it and we look at the pictures and think about the activities that we can do, there is an excitement that grows in us. Some of you are thinking about going back to the beach like a year from now, you know? You're like, I can't wait to get back in there. But your desire to be somewhere, because you've had a picture of it, you've had an experience of it, your desire to be in that place does affect you now. You begin to make decisions, you clear up your calendar, you maybe reprioritize financially your schedules, you say no to certain things because somebody has a project you could do that week, you're like, sorry, I'm gonna be gone. You begin to change everything to go and be a part of that place. And I think that's the same way that we're meant to think about heaven. That we have an enemy that has made the crowning achievement of what Christ has accomplished to us, for us, and what we are meant to inherit He's made it boring, mundane, obscure, when it's meant to stir something up inside of us that carries us through anything. Most of us, knowing the other end of something, can, can make our way through something. I've listened, uh, this summer, I listened to a bunch of books on Audible from Navy SEALs. I don't know, I just got on this kick, and you know, I feel like I'm a deadly weapon now. Uh, but it's probably not true. I think I probably picked up a few things. Uh, I feel like I went through buds. And so, but the, the idea is the thing that keeps them from ringing that bell in the most difficult, like pushing their bodies to the max, enduring things they've never endured, cold and heat and hunger and, and, and aches and pains and all the trials and tribulations, the thing that keeps them from ringing that bell and tapping out is the idea that at the end of it, I'm gonna be a seal. And in the same way in this life, this is why people are able to go to death for Christ because they understand they were looking to something far greater. And no matter what you do to me here, no matter what I encounter here, no matter what trial and tribulation and difficulty comes, I will endure because I know what waits for me. We talked about making sure we keep Jesus as the jewel of heaven, that heaven is not heaven without God. 
Even some theologians have gone as far to write that I would rather have hell with Christ than heaven without him. That's a stretch, okay, of the things, but that's what they're saying so much is that it's not heaven without him. But in the same way that my son, I want him to love me more than the things I give him. But when he has those priorities correct, it's the greatest, the best of both worlds. Me and mom worked really hard and we have this house and this yard and the things that we like to provide you with. And, and yet we also have brought you up to appreciate and love us first and foremost, not just the things that we can do so you're not a spoiled brat. But we get to enjoy them, enjoying us, enjoying these things. And so to separate the idea that we shouldn't be excited about the inheritance that is ours in heaven is unbiblical and wrong. And it doesn't match up with the way that, that God has set things. So yes, we look to him and long for him more than anything in heaven. would not be heaven without him. But there is something about us enjoying him, us enjoying each other, us enjoying what he has given us, and him enjoying us enjoying all of those things. Somebody want to repeat that back to me? <laughs> the hope of what is ours in Christ. Uh, as I've done in other weeks, there are times I'm going to jump to this book, uh, Randy Alcorn, this book on heaven, that um, is just... It's been absolutely incredible to me, incredible to my life. What I'll do next week at the end is I'll give my copy away to somebody. So if you're in here and you're thinking, I'd like to read that, um, then I'll do that next week. And then we'll make sure we put one in the church library uh, that's going to be opening here in a few weeks. So you can continue bringing, if you have any Christian books, fiction and nonfiction, that you enjoy, that have meant a lot to you, that you'd like to donate, please feel free to do that because we uh, are starting a library in the back. I wanted to read real quick just on that idea of the enemy robbing us from, from what we're meant to see is there's this diagram on page 161. The left side says what we assume about heaven. The right side says what the Bible says about heaven. And then I'll read this summary paragraph. What we assume about heaven is that it's a non-earth. What the Bible says is it's a new earth. What we assume is that it's unfamiliar, it's otherworldly. What the Bible says is it's familiar, it's earthly. What we assume is that it's disembodied, that, that there's, there's just kind of floating forms. But what the Bible says is that we're resurrected, embodied. What we assume is that it's foreign. What the Bible says is that it's home. What we assume is that we leave our favorite things behind. What the Bible says is that we retain the good, finding the best ahead. What we assume is there's no time and space. What the Bible says is there is time and space. We assume it's static, that it's, it's just one thing forever. What the Bible teaches is dynamic. It's changing, it's moving. What we assume is it's neither old, like Eden, nor new and earthly, just strange and unknown, but it's both old and new. What we assume is there's nothing to do, we just float on the clouds. What the Bible teaches is there's a God to worship and to serve, a universe to rule, purposeful work to accomplish, and friends to enjoy. What we assume is there's no learning or discovery, that we have this, this instant and complete knowledge of all things. But what the Bible teaches is there's an eternity of learning and discovering and continual revelation of who God is and what he's done and what he's created, which causes us to keep just, I mean, think about the little taste we have here. When you see something new about God or you, and I've encountered God's love every day of my life, but there are days, because I just know that he's with me. I'm not saying that every day I'm just like, oh, you know, floating on the clouds. But there are moments when God just overwhelms me and it's almost like I've never even heard of his love before and it just hits me brand new and there will be this, this continual revelation of God in heaven that will keep us going, you're so good, you're so wonderful, you're so awesome. We assume there is, it's boring. The truth is it's fascinating. We assume there's a loss of desire of, of the things God's put in us that we enjoy, but the Bible teaches there's a continuous fulfillment of desire and maybe even a carrying on of the passions, the good passions that God put in us here on earth and the things we love to do that are good and holy and right. That we assume there's an absence. Um, sorry, I got lost. Here we go. Here's the closing paragraph. What we have assumed about heaven has reduced it to a place we look forward to only as an alternative to an intolerable existence here on the present earth. Only the elderly, disabled, suffering, and persecuted might desire the heaven we imagine. 
but the Bible portrays life in God's presence, in our resurrected bodies, in a resurrected universe as so exciting and compelling that even the youngest and healthiest of us should daydream about it. This, this look at heaven for me has been paradigm shifting. It has began to color everything that I'm seeing in the Bible. The same way that there's a story in the book of Acts called the road to Emmaus. And after Jesus was risen, actually it might be in John's gospel, excuse me, if you correct me on that. There are two disciples that are walking after Jesus had been resurrected and they're talking about some of the events that had taken place. And Jesus comes up alongside them. They don't recognize that it's him. And it says that he begins to unfold for them, to explain to them the Christ, the Savior, the Messiah, the one who was to come. Like from the beginning of Scripture, the Scriptures they knew as Jews, the Old Testament, the prophecies, the, the um all that the prophets were saying and that the law, and they begin to see Jesus all through the scriptures. And their eyes are open, and they're like, man, was our heart not burning inside of us when he was speaking to us? And so there is this, this way now that as we look across the scriptures, things that we're like, how did they not see that? They just couldn't see it. We're on the other side looking back, going, yeah, okay, I see that. Jesus, all through history, it's all been about him, always and forever. In that same way that all of Scripture is painted as Jesus through all of it, I'm beginning to see heaven and the reality of it and how he's painted it for us in a way that I've never seen before, and I hope to show you some of that. Uh, even, let's talk about for a second Matthew. In Matthew chapter uh, 5, This is what I was referencing a few minutes ago. It's often called the Beatitudes. It's a part of the Sermon on the Mount. I actually want to start at Matthew 4, verse 23, and then I'm just going to read uh, to chapter 5, verse 12. And I want to try to show you, even in this, how there may be some of the things he was talking about were more literal. Because what we know about the kingdom of God, and, and we've talked about it in Talon, is it is now but not yet. Jesus came proclaiming a kingdom. But I think in our minds, we always just reference that as to the spiritual, ethereal kingdom. And that's a part of it, but I think he's calling us to look further than that. That yes, Jesus did not come at this time to establish a physical kingdom on the earth. That's not what he was doing. He came to bring the culture of heaven to earth, to challenge everything we ever thought was right, and to show us the truth. But what he has bought for us is an inheritance that is a physical kingdom. It is a new heavens and a new earth and a city, the new Jerusalem, that will be on the earth that the Bible says, I believe, is, it's square. It's 1,400 miles in every direction. They say it essentially stretches from west coast to east coast, north and south. But he says this in Matthew chapter 4, starting in verse 23. He went throughout all Galilee, teaching in their synagogues, proclaiming the gospel of the kingdom, and healing every disease and every, every affliction among the people. He was giving them a taste of a heaven that would have no disease, no affliction. So his fame spread throughout all of Syria. They brought him all the sick, those afflicted with various diseases, and pains, those oppressed by demons, epileptics, and paralytics, and he healed them. Again, it is a picture of a kingdom that is to come. And great crowds followed him from Galilee and Decapolis and from Jerusalem and Judea and from beyond the Jordan. Now, chapter 5. Seeing the crowds, he went up on the mountain, he sat down with his disciples, and they came to him. Verse 2. And he opened his mouth and taught them, saying, Look, look at where it starts. Verse 3. Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. We have talked about this before. The poor in spirit are those who recognize their deep need for Christ. 
So the more poverty we recognize we have in our spirit, we can't save ourselves, we don't know what's right, he knows what's right, the greater we get to take hold of what he has for us. But he's literally, he's not just saying, yes, we do, we get to take part of the kingdom of heaven now. There are parts of it that exist inside of us, and they're not like the physical, like what we live in, but the kingdom of heaven lives in us. But he is saying that you who make yourself poor in spirit, not the person who fights and struggles and fights and makes their way to the top, but the person who says, I'm in need, God. I'm not prideful. I'm a humble. The poor in spirit, you're going to get everything. You will inherit the kingdom of heaven. Verse 4. Blessed who are those who are mourned, for they shall be comforted. Blessed are the meek, for they shall inherit the earth. Does that not paint? A, we, we see that. Blessed are the meek, the people who walk humble and low, for they shall inherit the earth. We hear that in the sense that we will inherit all things, but I'm telling you, when I read it now, I'm just like, no, I know what he's talking about. We will inherit the new earth. He, it is our inheritance as sons and daughters. He will say, here, go, live, thrive, build, move, enjoy, eat. Verse 5, blessed are the meek, for they shall inherit the earth. Verse 6, blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they shall be satisfied. Blessed are the merciful, for they shall receive mercy. Blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God. You will see him. And we'll talk about that next week, this idea, because we know that if we were to see God now, we just melt, like you know, just turn into a pool to see him truly face to face, but that we will be able to behold him and see him. Blessed are the pure in heart, for they will see God. Blessed are the peacemakers, for they shall be called sons of God. Blessed are those who are persecuted for righteousness' sake, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. You only get persecuted when you stand up for things that are right, when everybody else thinks they're wrong, and people will deny you of things. And therefore you face persecution and, and what they want you to think is you're being robbed of something. You want to keep your life? Denounce Jesus. Uh, I'm sorry. This life is not everything for me. Jesus is Lord. You can do what you want with me. Because I'm inheriting the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are you when others revile you, persecute you, and utter all kinds of evil against you falsely on my account. Rejoice and be glad, for your reward is great in heaven. For so they persecuted the prophets who were before you. And we saw weeks ago, reading through Hebrews, that the prophets were all looking for a land that was to come, a city whose foundation was built by God. That is our home. God's not ashamed of his creation. He formed and fashioned it, and it was good. We talked about this with the kids last week. He formed and fashioned us, and we were very good. He desired our multiplication, our advancement, our dominion, our care, and our stewardship of all that he created. Now, there will not be, and we'll talk about this next week, there will not be multiplication in heaven. There will not be birth in heaven. But what God told us was to go forward on this earth before sin wrecked it, and to take dominion. Dominion is about caring for a place. He gave us the earth as a gift. So really quickly, I want to run through just a few things. Revelation chapter 21. I want to talk real quick about the first thing is this idea of is the earth destroyed or is it renewed? Because we encounter passages like this, and for the sake of time, uh, I'll only read one of them, but there are multiple. You can take a note, 2 Peter 3.10 as well. We'll talk about the idea of, of fire and the end of the earth. Revelation 21.1 says, Then I saw a new heaven. This is John. He's getting a vision of what is to come. That's what the book of Revelation is, revealing what is to come. It says, Then I saw a new heaven and a new earth. For the first heaven and the first earth had passed away, and the sea was no more. We'll talk about that idea of the sea in just a second as well. I saw a new heaven and a new earth, for the first heaven and the first earth had passed away, and the sea was no more. And like I said, there are other passages as well that talk about um, a burning with fire. 
And I, I wanted to read this to you real quick. It says that John Piper argues that God did not create matter to throw it away. He writes, when Re Revelation 21.1 and 2 Peter 3.10 say that the present earth and heavens will pass away, it does not have to mean that they go out of existence, but may mean that there will be such a change in them that their present condition passes away. We might say the caterpillar passes away and the butterfly emerges. There is a real passing away and there is a real continuity, a real connection. Part of it is the idea that the earth as it is most likely will not be totally unrecognizable for us. That what God has created is good. Now it may look very different, but that even in the idea, many of you have probably seen, if you've ever been camping or been anywhere, or you, maybe you did this to your own yard. I've had a few people, uh, neighbors over the years, that light their whole yards on fire. And it's a renewing. Is anybody, well, I won't have you raise your hand. But if you've ever seen controlled burns of forests, is that there is a passing away of what was, a burning of what was, but the point is it creates a fertile ground for something new to emerge. And that's very much the belief with the heavens and the earth is not that God's going to just like crush it and it will be gone, but that there will be a f there will be fire, and that's really what Second Peter even talks about the elements being burned uh, that will pass away as God recreates something new for us to enjoy. Um, I want to read this to you. If any of you have ever read the Chronicles of Narnia, um, C.S. Lewis was um, a Christian. C.S. Lewis was a man that God just gripped his heart and a very um, smart person as well. Um, the Chronicles of Narnia are all biblically based. And it was actually really important to C.S. Lewis. He and J.R. Tolkien, who did The Lord of the Rings, The Hobbit, uh, Silmarillion, things like that, were friends. And they would often meet together with some others as well. And even C.S. Lewis had a problem with some of J.R. Tolkien's writings in The Lord of the Rings because he was like, that's not clear enough. That doesn't, that's not clear enough as to what scripture says. J.R. Tolkien was a little heavier in some of the fantasy, and C.S. Lewis felt very strongly that everything needed a very clear biblical tie. But the last battle is the last book for the Chronicles of Narnia, and it talks about essentially the book of Revelation, the end of all things. But here's, here's what it says, and, and he, he quotes it in here to, to help give a picture as C.S. Lewis was reading this, the scriptures and getting a vision of what heaven might be like. And it says, uh, basically, as the world is passing away and they're stepping into Aslan's country, which is the picture of heaven, she notices something totally unexpected. She says, those hills, said Lucy, the nice woody ones and the blue ones behind, aren't they very like the southern border of Narnia? Like, cried Edmund after a moment's silence. Why, they're exactly like. Look, there's Mount, Mount Pyre with his fork, forked head, and there's the pass into Archenland and everything. And yet they're not like, said Lucy. They're different. They have more colors on them, and they look further away than I remembered, and they're more. More, oh, I don't know. More like the real thing, said the Lord Diggory softly. Suddenly, far side the eagle spread his wings, soared 30 or 40 feet up into the air, circled around, and alighted on the ground. Kings and queens, he cried, we have all been blind. We are only beginning to see where we are. From up there, I have seen it all. And he named several places. Narnia is not dead. This is Narnia. But how can it be, said Peter? Aslan told us, the older ones, that we should never return to Narnia, and here we are. Yes, said Eustace, and we saw it all destroyed and the sun put out. And it's all so different, said Lucy. The eagle is right, said Diggory. Listen, Peter, when Aslan said you could never go back to Narnia, he meant the Narnia you were thinking of. But that was not the real Narnia. That had a beginning and an end. It was only a shadow or a copy of the real Narnia, which has always been here and always will be here, just as our own world, England and all, is only a shadow or copy of something in Aslan's real world. You need not mourn over Narnia, Lucy. All of the old Narnia that mattered, all the dear creatures have been drawn into the real Narnia through the door, and of course it is different, as different as a real thing is from a shadow or a waking of a life's dream. 
but it goes on, this idea of them seeing and noticing as they move further into the land that God has prepared for them, that it is the same, but it is different. And I think that that's what the heavens will be like for us here on this earth. There will be a burning, a destruction to a renewal. Um, and some of what was may be preserved, and we'll even talk about that a little more next week. I want to read for you the totality of Revelation 21 and 22. And that's kind of where we'll, we'll finish up together, and I hope to point out a, a few things as we do that. And I just want to encourage you, if you want the full picture, this book, Heaven, by Randy Alcorn, is a great one, even just to kind of flip the things you're interested in. But here's where we get one of the greatest um, pictures of the new heavens and the new earth at the end of the book of Revelation. And obviously, when we finish talking about heaven, uh, we're going to talk about hell as well. So you'll have to forgive me for not answering any of the questions as it references hell in here. Um, but I'm excited about that as well. I think it's equally important that we really look at what the Bible says and not just what we've made up in our own minds. Revelation 21 and 22 says, Then I saw a new heaven and a new earth. For the first heaven and the first earth had passed away, and the sea was no more. So the idea of the sea being no more, there's a few different beliefs about that. Um, there are beliefs that the seas as we know them were a result of the flood. And God said, I will never flood the earth, the whole earth again, which is where he gave us the sign of the rainbow in the sky so that it is his promise to us that he will never flood the earth. It's beautiful. When it rains, there's this thought, God, will you flood the earth again? Maybe you don't ever think about that. Um, but when you see the rainbow in the sky, it's his promise to us, a seal to us that he will never do that again but that he will come in a different way and there will be fire and a renewal of all things. But the idea of there not being sea is some people think that even the seas as we have them, the salt and how they work is part of kind of keeping our ecosystem alive and that may not be necessary in the new earth. And more so that even if the ocean itself is not as we know it, that there are still great lakes um, We'll see in a moment the idea of the river of life that flows from the throne of God, that there may be branches of it, tributaries, larger lakes, but these places of, of fresh water that are good to drink. Um, and so there's also an idea that for the people in this time, the idea of the sea could be a terribly awful thing, that we've come a long way in seafaring, um, but the sea is still an awful place. The sea is dangerous. And, um, and I think that many of us know that if we really think about it, not just hopping on the lake in our boat, but going out into the ocean, it can be a very, very treacherous place. And so there was this idea, too, of peace, that the sea as they knew it, of a place of death and, and difficulty, that place was no more. It says, And I saw the holy city, New Jerusalem, coming down out from heaven from God, prepared as a bride adorned for her husband. And I heard a loud voice from the throne saying, Behold, the dwelling place of God is with man. He will dwell with them, and they will be his people. And God himself will be with them as their God. He will wipe away every tear from their eyes, and death shall be no more. Neither shall there be mourning, M-O-U-R-N-I-N-G, nor crying, nor pain anymore. For the former things have passed away. See, it's a renewal. And he who was seated on the throne said, Behold, I am making all things new. Also he said, Write this down, for these words are trustworthy and true. And he said to me, It is done. I am the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end. To the thirsty I will give from the spring of the water of life without payment. There's this idea of drinking in heaven. The one who conquers will have this heritage. Do you understand that? That is yours. It is your heritage. It is your, your inheritance. And I will be his God and he will be my son. But as for the cowardly, the faithless, the detestable, as for murderers, the sexually immoral, sorcerers, idolaters, and all liars, those who are unrepentant, their portion will be in the lake that burns with fire and sulfur, which is the second death. Then came one of the seven angels who had the seven bowls full of the seven last plagues and spoke to me saying, come, I will show you the bride, the wife of the lamb. The lamb is a picture of Jesus. He carried me away in the spirit to a great high mountain and showed me the holy city, Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from God. It's a picture of the new earth. And so he takes him to a mountain. That's why you can also pick up just these little things that are physical characteristics that we know. If we want to know somewhat of what heaven is going to be like, all we need to do is look around and look at what our earth is like, but imagine it like we've never seen it before in all of its restoration. Having the glory
glory of God, its radiance like a most rare jewel, like a jasper clear as crystal. It had a great high wall with 12 gates, and at the gates, 12 angels, and on the gates, the names of the 12 tribes of the sons of Israel were inscribed. On the east, three gates, on the north, three gates, on the south, three gates, and on the west, three gates. And the wall of the city had 12 foundations, and on them were the 12 names of the 12 apostles of the Lamb. And the one who spoke with me had a measuring rod of gold to measure the city and its gates and its walls. The city lies four square, its length the same as its width, and he measured the city with his rod, 12,000 stadia. Its length and width and height are equal, so that most people believe that comes out to about 1,400 miles. He also measured its wall, 144 cubits by human measurement, which is also an angel's measurement. That's interesting. Uh, what is it, uh, metric or imperial system? Yeah, the, uh, we use the angel's measurements. Angelic. The wall was built of jasper, while the city was pure gold, like clear glass. The foundations of the wall of the city were adorned with every kind of jewel. The first was jasper, the second sapphire, the third agate, the fourth emerald. You see these physical characteristics, these things that God has put in the earth that he has not eliminated, but that he has taken and put and showed us how, how he's created all things good. The fifth onyx, the sixth carnelian, the seventh chrysolite, the eighth beryl, the ninth topaz, the tenth chrysoprase, the eleventh jacinth, the twelfth amethyst, and the twelve gates were twelve pearls, each of the gates made of a single pearl, and the street of the city was pure gold like transparent glass. I like to think of the, uh, the road to the Bifrost and Thor. Okay. And I saw no temple in the city, for its temple is the Lord God, the Almighty, and the Lamb. The city has no need of sun or moon to shine on it, for the glory of God gives it light, and its lamp is the lamp. By its light will the nations walk, and the kings of the earth will bring their glory into it. That's part of why they, the idea that it's not, we're not just confined to this city, but we're sent out to explore, and that there's this continuity between the end of our things and the beginning of the next thing, that the nations will bring into the city of God the glory of the nations. And the gates will never be shut by day, and there will be no night there. They will bring it into it the glory and the honor of the nations, but nothing un unclean will ever enter into it, nor anyone who does what is detestable or false, but only those who are written in the Lamb's Book of Life. So partly, real quick, and I thank you for being patient with me. Imagine if I tried to get next week into what I wanted to talk about today. This idea is that the Bible never actually says there will not be a son. Some people think that was not going to be any sun. Like, eternal daylight sounds terrible. We also have to recognize our understanding of that is, is, is so limited. It never says the sun will go away. It just says there will not be a need for the sun in the new Jerusalem. Because there is an idea of the greater light outweighing the lesser lights. And if you really go back to the Genesis story, light existed before the sun and the moon were created. A lot of people are like, wait, that's weird, because God says, let there be light. And then later on, he says, let me put the sun and the moon in the sky to tell seasons and days and hours. And the idea is that the glory of God was its light. And so in the same sense, it is not, and we'll talk about that next week, do we sleep, things like that? Are there sunsets and sunrises? Some people believe the idea that maybe even if we don't see the sunset because of the glory of God in the, in the Jerusalem, there will be places to see sunsets and sunrises. But that's just a little note on the idea of the sun and the moon. Verse chapter 22, and this is where we'll end. Then the angel showed me the river of the water of life, bright as crystal, flowing from the throne of God and of the Lamb through the middle of the street of the city. Part of that is showing that the sustenance what we draw from for our life and our satisfaction flows from God. A literal uh, river of life. And it says, though the middle of the street of the city, through the middle of the street of the city, also on either side of the river, the tree of life with its 12 kinds of fruit, yielding its fruit each month. Part of that helps us see that there is an eating in heaven, and, and I'll show you that in just a moment. But the idea is that there is this primary river that flows through the city of God from the throne of the presence of God, and on either side, multiples is from what the text shows us, 
kinds of fruits and kinds of trees that are given to us, and they yield their fruit in season each month. This is part of why they believe there is not a complete ending of time, that there is a difference between eternity and infinity. Infinity is this loop that's almost static in nature. Eternity is going on, but that we will still experience seasons, months and days and hours living together. Though, here on earth, time is, is a negative thing to us in some sense, always pushing on to an end or to something else. He says it way better in the book. I just don't have time to go there. But the idea that time for us no more carries any kind of weight or sorrow or, or struggle or stress upon us. And so this idea of yielding fruit each month, it goes on to say, the leaves of the tree were for the healing of the nations. The leaves of the tree were for the healing of the nations. There's an idea that we will be able, the same way Adam and Eve, God created trees for them bearing fruit and told them to eat of them. There was one tree, the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. He said, that thing you cannot have part in. That tree is not mentioned anywhere in the end because there will no longer be this ability for us to sin. We'll talk about that next week as well. But that part of the idea of eating in heaven is not that we would die without eating, but that God has given us food as joy. There's an enjoyment in what he has created. We did not invent food. God created food, made our bodies in need of it, and we get to take of it and to talk about it in the, the best sense that it was created for us is the idea that part of it is our continual recognition of our need for God and the joy that that presents. Let me encourage you. When you pray for your food, I don't even call it bless the food because I never ever, that's fine if you do that. I'm not saying it's wrong. I never ever say God bless my food. I don't see the, I don't see the pattern in scripture of blessing food. I see the pattern in scripture of thanksgiving, of giving thanks to God for what he's provided. And so I try to even teach my kids, hey, when we, we're, we're going to give thanks. And we simply just take a moment to recognize, I didn't grow this. I didn't make this. Maybe I cooked it, but it would not be here if it were not for him. And he's so good to put it on my table. And he's so good to give me energy to work, to provide for my family. And I just want to recognize for a minute my great need of you, God. Thank you for what you've done for us. Thank you for your provision. Thank you for keeping our table full. We love you. In Jesus' name, amen. Eat your cookies. <laughs> and so the idea of eating in heaven, even from these trees, the tree of life, the healing of the nations, is a continual reminder of God's goodness that he, the fruit never stops yielding. He always does it in season, and we can trust him for it. No longer will there be anything accursed but the throne of God and the Lamb will be in it, and his servants will worship him. They will see his face, and his name will be on their foreheads. And night will be no more. They will need no light of lamp or sun, for the Lord God will be their light, and they will reign forever and ever. And he said to me, these words are trustworthy and true, and the Lord, the God of the spirits of the prophets, has sent his angel to show his servants what must soon take place. And behold, I am coming soon. Blessed is the one who keeps the words of the prophecy of this book. I, John, am the one who heard and saw these things. And when I heard and saw them, I fell down to worship at the feet of the angel who showed them to me. But he said to me, you must not do that. I am a fellow servant. We'll talk about our relationship with angels. I am a fellow servant with you and your brothers, the prophets, and with those who keep the words of this book, worship God. And he said to me, do not seal up the words of the prophecy of this book, for the time is near. Let the evildoers still do evil, and the filthy still be filthy, and the righteous still do right, and the holy still be holy. He's saying, don't close this up. Share it as life keeps moving on. Behold, I am coming soon, bringing my recompense with me to repay each one for what he has done. I am the Alpha and the Omega, the first and the last, the beginning and the end. Blessed are those who wash their robes so that they may have the right to the tree of life and that they may enter the city by the gates. Outside are the dogs and sorcerers, the sexually immoral and murderers and idolaters and everyone who loves and practices falsehood. I, Jesus, have sent my angel to testify to you about these things for the churches. I am the root and the descendant of David, the bright morning star. 
The spirit and the bride say, come, that's us. The spirit inside of us and the bride, we are the bride, say, come, come, Lord. And let the one who hears say, come. And let the one who is thirsty come. Let the one who desires take the waters of life without price. I warn everyone who hears the words of the prophecy of this book. If anyone adds to them, God will add to him plagues described in this book. If anyone takes away from the word of the book of this prophecy, God will take away his share in the tree of life and in the holy city which are described in this book. He who testifies to these things says, Surely I am coming soon. That's Jesus. Surely I am coming soon. And we say, Amen. Come, Lord Jesus. The grace of the Lord Jesus be with all. Amen. Let me pray for us. Father, I just ask in the name of Jesus, just as we've gone through this morning together and we've seen your themes all through here this morning, this calling to come to you. God, I pray it would just be sobering for us as people. I pray in the name of Jesus against an ignorance the enemy wants to keep over us. I pray we would understand the reality of sin and righteousness of heaven and hell, of your words that there are truth to us, that God, the areas in our lives where we need to be convicted, that you would convict us and say, that's not what I called you to. I've created a place for you and I have called you to be my own. Come out and be part of me, that we would recognize it is your great love and compassion that calls to us. It is the kindness of the Lord that leads us to repentance. How could we not hear and look and see in all that you've prepared for us and co- not go, you did that for me? Why? We are orphans without you. You called us those that you adopt and call into your family. We have no right to stake. We can't say, that's mine, I deserve it, give it to me. All we can do is say, I don't deserve it. I shouldn't have it. Thank you. Let us be a people that are awake and alive and longing for your return. Thank you for the good things we have on this earth. God, I thank you for my wife. I thank you for my children. I thank you for the purposes you've called me to. I thank you for my friends and my family. And God, all the little things that I get to enjoy. I thank you for your goodness to me, even in the hardest moments of my life. Thank you for your faithfulness that you endure with me. But it is nothing to what awaits us. If you're in here today and you don't have a relationship with Jesus, we've talked about the idea that our longing for heaven and to be with Christ should outweigh our fear of hell. And he's calling you today to say, repent of your sin. Recognize that you cannot earn your salvation that you are not righteous without him. What the Bible calls us to do is to recognize Jesus as Lord. That he is king and he is God. To ask for the forgiveness of our sins and that he is just and good and righteous to forgive you of your sin and wash you clean and give you an inheritance in heaven. And all you have to do is call to him. Forgive me of my sin. You were crucified for me and you rose from the dead and now you are living and one day you will return and I will dwell with you forever. We love you, Lord. In Jesus' name, amen.